the reason there is so much, uh, people have such a, a difficult time deciding why uh, I've been successful for this long or, or trying to quantify um, my talent is because it's been so obvious from day one that I wanted to be a star that people found it very hard to believe that I also wanted to be a musician. Born George Panayotou in 1963, George Michael is the son of a successful Greek Cypriot restaurateur. He spent his early years in the middle-class comfort of North London suburbs. When he was 12, his parents moved to Hertfordshire, and George went to school in Bushy, where he was to meet his future Wham partner, Andrew Ridgely. I was introduced as a second-year student into uh, Bushy Meads comprehensive and Andrew was appointed to take care of me. He was in fact the, uh, the, the one to initiate the first group because I had a very, even though I had a very strong will, I also knew that um, basically I was going to get thrown out of, ha of, of uh, my very comfortable position at home if I didn't stick to uh, the uh, studying and if I didn't at least pretend that I wanted to get some A-levels. Um, so I did that. Andrew's real ambition when we met was to be either a footballer or a pop star. He, he knew he didn't want to go to university and uh, he wanted to start a band. It's my first top of the box and it's their first top of the box. Wow! In 1982, George Michael and Andrew originally formed Wham! and went on to become the most successful pop duo of the decade. Well, I haven't seen your face around town a while. I second greeted you with an annoying smile. When I saw that girl upon your arm, I knew she won your heart with a fatal charm. I said, so boy, let's hit the tennis, hey boy. And what's with the frown? But in return, all you could say was, hi, George, meet my fiance. Well, I first saw them on top of the pops, so the potential I saw was it was an instantly a television potential. And they projected themselves in a way which no other group on Top of the Pops I'd ever seen had done. Both as a group, in that they seemed to have understood how to use Top of the Pops to project themselves. And they came across with this incredible, sort of erotic intimacy. Call me good, call me bad, call me anything you want to, baby. But I know uh, that you're sad, and I know. When the two of you carved out Wham, did you feel you were going against the prevailing trend or did you feel you were going with the trend that only you two knew about? Where were you directing yourselves then or was it all a fluke? Um, I think that with the, the only fluke was how early it happened. I, I think that uh, we actually had a very strong sense of, being doing, of doing something different, which really... Um, didn't get appreciated at the time. I mean, there was a, such a strong uh, tongue-in-cheek element to the first three singles, and we were hailed as as uh, being some kind of uh, social, um, you know, commentators, like spokesmen for our generation. I.e., that we'd been on the dole. Well, actually, I hadn't. I mean, Andrew had been on the dole for years, borrowing money off me. Wham Rap and Young Guns were among the first white rap parodies to achieve British chart success. Both songs, released in 1982, celebrated the lifestyle of the young, unattached or unemployed male. Well, folks will be a drag if work can you bag And when you let them know You're more dead than alive in a nine to five Then they say you've got to go And get yourself a job Or get out of this house Get yourself a job Are you a man or a mouse? A finger in each ear You pretend not to hear Gotta get some space Get out of this place We, we didn't see how why everything had to be so down. Um, so I suppose about the same time that groups like Haircut 100 were bringing pop back, 
we thought we'd make pop records with a little bit of black influence and and throw in some humorous lyrics but unfortunately the humorous lyrics were taken by a lot of people very seriously and kind of uh, shook up our own vision of what we were supposed to be doing because obviously when you're 18 years old and suddenly you're successful you start to think oh um, well if that's what I'm successful for if I'm supposedly supposed to be making these very uh, you know if I'm supposed to be representing my generation uh, then I'd better start doing something about it you know and I think for a while we got a bit confused pop groups of, represent their period of, often later people say that they influence the period but pop groups really are a a reflection of the period, so I think they were very much a part of their times. After all, the first song they did was, was Wham Rap about being on the dole. Um, it was very, it was totally unheard of at that time for well-educated middle-class kids to be on the dole. That was a completely new experience, and that was very largely a part of what made them successful. Because here they were, um, all these other middle-class kids on the dole who, who'd been told it was impossible if you went to school and, and you had good family behind you to end up in this situation. They're immediately connected with them. But then so did all the working class kids because they, they were also used to being on the dole. So they, they crossed all these class barriers just, just like that. The only real important thing about Wham in terms of moving away from what was happening at the time was that most of the, the recent music had been very down in terms of youth. With this slick Motown-influenced dance record, the rebelliousness of Wham's early rap records was abandoned. The leather jackets traded for an image of clean-cut, middle-class well-being. typical kind of second generation immigrant in that sense that if I got anything from my my father's side it was the presumption that you go on and you move up I mean I was definitely supposed to become an accountant or a lawyer there was never any question that I was going to be anything other than a very upwardly mobile child What reaction did you have to the press associating you with the yuppie Thatcher enterprise image of mm -hmm. the 80s? Did you feel that was unfair? Did you go along with it? How did you react to it? Well, I don't think... I don't really think that that was something that was very temporary. I think I'm still very much uh, um, a victim of, of uh, timing in that sense. I mean, I understand totally why people line me up with... Um, uh, Th Thatcher and line me up with the, the whole yuppie movement and everything. I find it insulting that people are that simplistic about what they think um, Thatcher means to people who've grown up in the last uh, 10 years. Um, I also find it very, very... Uh, I find it quite pathetic that people believe that someone who is, who's come from being unsuccessful um, at my age to being very successful uh, when it's in a creative environment. I mean, this is probably one of the few few industries, I can't think of any other industry other than uh, the film industry, where someone of my age can move independently through a business, or not independently, but basically be their own boss, um, because they have, uh, they, basically they have the, uh, the raw material. Someone can move through the business um, to a powerful position, but not necessarily have had to make terrible uh, um, moral compromises or walk on people or do very monetary things. We had the situation in a Thatcherite England where it was suddenly very respectable to be prosperous. And all through the 70s, credibility was based on not wanting to make money, but actually wanting to make very serious records. Suddenly, credibility was that you were aiming to make money and to succeed financially. And that was a nerve they touched on. I think all the other people who were fed up with, with um, not, not achieving suddenly decided they wanted to achieve in a financial way, and Wham identified that for them. Wham, I thought, was very pure in its, uh, in, uh, in its conception of two young guys who were, to some degree, uh, hedonistic and escapist. But I suppose the, the outward appearance was very 
Thatcherist. The imagery and the, the sense of what Wham was came entirely from Andrew. And George, when he was younger, wasn't pleased with the way he looked and was, and had copied Andrew. And eventually he became a pretty good lookalike, so that contrary to what most people say, that Andrew had no part in Wham, it was totally the opposite. Wham was Andrew. It, was, it wasn't even Andrew and George, it was Andrew and Andrew, the real Andrew and the fake one. So it was difficult to, to identify then what their respective roles were in the songwriting, but they were totally essential to the projection and, and recording of them. But as time went on, I think George, partly because he really did feel that the group wasn't him, uh, he put more and more effort into the songwriting and production and began to take it away from Andrew. And Andrew was reasonably indifferent to that and was an easy-going person, so he let George do it. The funny part about um, the, uh, all the, the uh, speculation about my input and Andrew's input is that between the two of us, we got it all sorted out very, very early. And basically, in terms of the songwriting, Andrew said, off you go, you know. He said, you know, I want us to be the biggest group in the world, and, and I think the way to do it is to let you go with it. It wasn't that Andrew didn't believe he could contribute anything. I think he just saw that I had to be kind of let off the rain. So when it came to things like everything she wants, I'd reached a kind of dilemma. At the same time that Wan decided that they were going to rush off to Ibiza and make videos and get brown, I had decided that I was going to write uh, without any kind of restraints in terms of the band. So I thought, what do I want to do? Do I want to uh, write person in, in a much more personal sense and throw off the band image or do i want to go with the band image and write for the band and i didn't think that either of those were necessary i i believed that i could do both and and have to live with the results for a while and then make up for it later which is was basically the plan so it was a big decision to make and at times I was thinking, I'm never going to get out of this. I'm never going to be seen as a writer. I'm never going to get my credibility back. Uh, but I just, you know, I just kept going. In a lot of your answers, you, you are obviously very careful and considered about your career. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that you have been in charge of it for quite a while now? <clears throat> I think I've been in charge of it probably from about four weeks after I got my record contract. I mean, I, I had this uh, vision as a child of the rock and roll business. And uh, I was, once I, I mean, I remember, I remember sitting in um, the office or the, uh, it was like makeshift office of our first record company director whose name was Mark Dean. And I remember being so, you know, I was almost like kissing the ground where you walked and I was just so, so pleased that I'd got this break and I knew I was actually officially going to be able to go home to mum and dad and say, I'm going to get a record contract. And it was like so the, uh, overwhelming for me that I just thought for about three or four weeks I would go into meetings and sit and talk to people and make, and make it totally clear to them I was perfectly prepared to do anything they wanted, I would do whatever they wanted if they could make me a pop star, right? And uh, it lasted for about, about three or four weeks and then I realised that people didn't know how to do it. They literally didn't have a clue how to do it. And uh, the realisation was just so... Um, it was so, uh, such a shock that I think my immediate reaction was right. If they don't know how to do it, I'm not going to do anything they want me to do, and I'm going to lay it out exactly as I see it. There's a paradox here, though, isn't there? Because getting control of your career and getting a grip on it and organising things has liberated you to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's brought you the accusation of being very calculating. So how do you cope with that? Um, well, one of the, the, one of the uh, more interesting aspects of being accused well, I don't think it's such an accusation. I think calculation can be... Uh, calculation is just another, um, uh, another way of saying in some, in some instances that someone's thought something out. I mean, I, I can understand people's criticisms of, of my presentation or of... Uh, of, of uh, I mean, I cringe at some of the things I've done, as an art, not as an artist, as a performer. Um, but 
I can see that... I, mean, I don't turn around and cringe really at anything that I've written. I can see that some things are worse than others, but I don't look at anything and say, he did that to get from here to there. You know, whereas people don't seem to believe that's the case. I think my progression has been natural, and it's a writer's progression. Other people just see it part of the, as part of this big, uh, this, um, you know, ascendant career. George Michael's first step towards a solo career came in 1984 with the release of Careless Whisper. The song, written in 1981 when he was just 17, pushed him into the spotlight as a solo performer, although at the time he was still part of Wham. The most uh, uh, memorable thing that I've ever written would be the saxophone break in Careless Whisper. That's what people would point at me and say, oh, I, well, you know, this is his, his moment, which is a bit scary considering it's like nine years ago. <laughs> to me, it's a very precocious piece of work that was drawn, drawing in um, lots of different uh, influences and, and it seems to have come together. I mean, it doesn't sound like a song that was written by a 17 year old, but um, I don't understand why not, because I, had, I didn't know anything about life then. I certainly didn't know anything very serious about romance. Can we do something? Uh, it's just in the monitors, just soften them a little bit. The brightness. And also uh, a repeat or a play, something that's just gonna soften it. It's just hitting me really hard up here. One of the, the main attractions of a song written by someone else is that there is nothing personal about it. And come! It's not long enough to play. It's not carrying it. You know your last phrase, the, two, the four bar phrase, and I'll just sing. A desert road from Vegas to nowhere. Let's see what it sounds like. Vegas to nowhere. Yeah, just like that. So what I'll, I'll do, I'll sing the, the whole two verse section where I sing the hot dry wind bit and the, the, those two verses. And then I'll do one. I'm calling you, I'm calling you. And then, then you come in again with uh, the solo and then finish it with those two lines. There is some kind of release for me in the middle of a... a um, performance to actually stop singing me and just saying right this is an instrument and this is me using it to the best of my ability let me warm up man is that the key a desert road from Vegas to nowhere someplace better than where you've been A coffee machine that needs some fixing In a little cafe just around the bend
range is something that, again, is a very important consideration. That's a very strong um, reason for me doing so many Stevie Wonder covers. I've done, in over various sets, I've done like four or five Stevie Wonder covers, and, and uh, apart from the fact that I, I consider him to be an incredible writer, um, his voice, the, the, the key that he was writing, and also over a certain time period, because now he tends to write in a much higher key, but the key he was writing for at that time is perfectly suited to my voice. And somehow I managed to really get something out of his songs live. <laughs> to the bass there, yes. when it goes into, uh, tell me who I am, yeah. 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 it just goes, yeah. last time goes, shame to when it was like, living future paradise, it goes straight into it, it's shame to when it was like, living in the future the bass, right? Just because I want to keep it light and then we can see what we can put in on the bass. Because all a full bass line is going to be... Yeah. I think an ordinary bass is going to be too heavy on this, don't you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it needs, is a really light synth bass line. Yeah. Do, do, do. All that stuff, you know? That would be the cleverest idea, wouldn't, mm. it, wouldn't it? Do you want to have a go, then? Oh. Julie Birchard, in which you said, I'm not what stars are made of. I'm not Prince, and I'm not Madonna. What were you saying about yourself there? I think what I was probably saying at the time, although I didn't understand it at the time, um, was that in the real sense, uh, in a, the real stars, I think, uh, the real stars that have, that have come out of media in the last 50 or 60 years, if you think of huge stars, they're almost always like racked with insecurity. I mean, I would, I would say I have my insecurity the same as everybody else. And I think that um, success uh, over a number of years has kind of ironed out a lot of them. But I never wanted to be someone else. I wanted to be a star and I wanted people to love me you know, and recognize me in the street. As a child, that was what I wanted. But I never really wanted to be someone else. And I think the people that, that are the most vivid and uh, uh, colorful, fascinating stars are always people who basically want to be someone else. I believe that of Madonna. Um, I believe that of Prince. I believe that of Michael Jackson. I'm not saying this is a terrible flaw and it actually makes them very, very interesting people. But um, I've never seen myself in that, in that light. I, all I knew at the time, I don't think I really understood it when I, when I was speaking to Julie Birchall, but uh, all I knew at the time was that, um, I just didn't see myself as someone living 24 hours a day as a star. In 1986, Wham! ended. A year later, George Michael released his solo album, Faith, which included the controversial song and video, I Want Your Sex. I was trying to make was that the most attractive form of sex that you can promote is the idea of being totally in love with someone but also wanting to rip their clothes off. 
it really wasn't anything like as, as throwaway or, or as irresponsible as people try to make it out to be. I mean, to the extent that the word monogamy appeared in the video. is huge in America. It basically launched my career with such a bang, no pun intended, launched my career with such a bang that I, 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 uh, I mean, I couldn't have wished for anything better to happen in a, in a, in a, um, in, in the sense that my, my career needed to go somewhere, I needed to do an about turn. In May 1988, Faith became the first album by a white solo artist to reach the top of the Billboard Black Album chart. To say that you're number one on the top of the Billboard Black Chart is to say that you are not an impersonator. Because, I mean, I knew that I'd been accused of being just an impersonator for so long. And to, to get yourself to that position, there has to be... Um, there has to have to be plenty of uh, black um, kids and adults in America that genuinely see you as a... As a as a soul singer. Now, to me, that does not mean that, I, that you sound like a black um, singer or that you are a soul artist, because I don't think um, that that has got anything to do with what, why I sold those records. I think it's to do with uh, singing something and putting songs into uh, um, a black context in terms of the, the backing tracks, and, and what you sing over the top of them has to be for real. And Further recognition came when George Michael won in three categories at the American Music Industry Awards. However, two of these awards proved highly controversial, since they'd traditionally gone to black artists. I beat Michael Jackson and Bobby Brown and a couple of other people in different categories, and I totally agree with the criticism that uh, the, as they are public awards, a lot of white people are going to vote for a white guy before they're going to vote for a black guy. The black male artist works very hard to get his due in that area to say, you are the best. So when you have an outsider to come into that, that has all of these other opportunities, it'd be something different if Bobby Brown had a cross the board play and he could compete in the same category as George Michael competes in. That would be a whole nother thing. But to get to be pop male vocalist of the year, he's just not going to be considered. There is as much daylight set between Gladys Knight and George uh, and, and Bobby Brown, who, who, uh, who is black and makes pop records, as there is between Gladys Knight and George Michael, who is white and makes pop records. Now, they're all working vaguely within a, an R&B idiom, but Gladys Knight is what someone of my age calls a soul singer in that her chief tool is her voice and what she can say with that metaphysically and all of that stuff. Um, which is not what Bobby Brown's about. Bobby Brown and George are about making cracking dance records with good tunes that you can whistle on the radio. Now that seems to me absurd that, that's, that both Gladys Knight, George and Bobby Brown should all be included in the same catch-all phrase. And that's where the problem lies. Everybody in the house make some noise! Gladys Knight was not a lone dissenting voice. Other black artists, such as Spike Lee and Dionne Warwick, publicly criticised the awards for racial bias. Further criticism came from Public Enemy, a successful and politically militant rap group. We believe that black people are first world people. Not third world, because I don't know where third world came from. I didn't ask to be given those awards, or I'm not going to um, pretend I wasn't happy to get them. But I find it very, uh, I do understand, um, I understand the, the, the attitude which says, or the argument that says that this is just, um, this guy is just uh, 
an acceptable version of black music for white America. That's been a criticism for a long time, hasn't it? White Absolutely. guys come along and Absolutely. plunk Absolutely. I mean, it goes music. all the way back to Elvis, doesn't That's it, obviously. Right. Um, <laughs> but I think that at, at the end of the day, I just wanted... I'm very pleased that a lot of black people appreciate my music, and I know that they do. I know that, the, that winning those awards or getting that, those kind of uh, um, chart positions are also very uh, largely attributable to um, black people that do like my music, that buy my music, or that like me as a vocalist. And that, that means that, I, that, that, that somehow I'm doing something right as a vocalist. I don't think I sound black. I've never thought I sounded black. I don't think that, um, that, uh, that there is any... I don't think there's any attempt to, to kind of um, steal black heritage in what I'm doing. I, I, all, all I think that's happening is I'm trying to make good music. Don't you delay. I can understand, for instance, people who have a very strong objection to me being quoted as a soul singer or being on top of the black charts. I understand their point, but I actually think that, that white and black uh, people making uh, similar music and and crossing over that way can't be anything but but a good thing. With an endless desire, I, I kept on searching. Sure, in time, my eyes would meet. Like the bridge is on fire. The hell is over. One touch is a need free. No, I don't regret it. George Michael's success as a solo performer has enabled him to work with some of the black artists he's always admired. From his earliest days, he's been influenced by and borrowed from the best of black American music. Wham! when they first appeared, a white English suburban rap group. That's what they were important for. They were the first good white rap group. Um, then they, they turned into a, a, into a neat little R&B pop group. Um, uh, when you think of uh, Wake Me Up Before You Go Go, um, it's all about uh, early Motown, Smokey Robinson, buzzword go go. You think of uh, Smokey in a mohair suit in the Apollo in Harlem in 1962. Um, he's always covered Stevie Wonder songs. He's been endorsed by Stevie Wonder, Aretha Franklin, the works um, and he's become uh, it would be wrong to say he's become a, a, sur a surrogate R&B artist but George is all about R&B in fact I think he's probably the best white R&B performer I can think of associated black music with sexuality and expression and tried to really pull those things out of myself by throwing myself into that that genre um, and I I find that as I as I back off of the uh, the uh, that sexual projection which I do find I, I, I have started to do um, that I find it less necessary to place myself uh, with black music because I after all I grew up listening very much to a mixture of black and white music I mean I loved Elton John I loved other um, white artists in the 70s and it was only really in the, the late later half of, of um, my teens that I really got influenced by black music so um, it's almost like now I choose to use black music specifically uh, or to, to draw from black influences specifically when that is what I want to express.
While recording in studios in West London, George Michael explained the musical ideas behind one of the tracks. This particular song was just called uh, Waiting for That Day. It wasn't the normal writing process because I had the idea for the mood as opposed to a song. I was with some friends and I was complaining about the fact that something like five or six of the, um, of the uh, records in the top 30 at a particular time um, were based around a sample of a drum, uh, uh, drum track, which was the intro to a James Brown song called Funky Drummer, which has now become like the most uh, well-used um, drum track of all time, I would imagine. Um, and I had this idea of taking something, or taking that particular drum track, and placing something completely different something completely out, out of context over the top of it. The, the drum track is this. Hopefully it should come up now. Come on. And that is actually the, the, the sample of the James Brown record, but it's slowed down. It's been slowed down for a number of other records. And then I thought I'd put something completely, completely folk over the top of it. And we've got some backing vocals there, but this is the guitar line. which obviously is about as unblack as you can get. And then mix the two. And then add a little bit of bass. So I started writing around that. And then um, just playing about uh, with a keyboard, I just found the two, the two chords that went, went with uh, those guitar chords. But the sound itself um, made me think that the, maybe I should take the song in a slightly different direction because the sound was uh, this sound. which is a very, very 60s, it's like Procol Harum or something like that. Very, very 60s sound. And when you combine it, when you combine these two things, you get an altogether different feel. So I, I actually left the guitars reasonably low down in the mix. So then I basically had to um, to write something that fit that feel, and I mean that th this is the first first track on this particular album anywhere. I've just found I found the feel before I had any idea what I was going to write over the top, and I tried all kinds of things, and at the end of the day, I decided to go for the something really really um, white sounding uh, influence wise, just to uh, just to kind of offset that very very uh, overused. Black rhythm. Now everybody's talking about this new decade. Like you say, the magic numbers, they'll just say goodbye to the stupid mistakes you made. Oh, my memory, oh, my memory. serves me far too well. But you know that the years will. What is it that appeals to you about being a writer? And what do you, why do you want to be a writer so much more than anything else? Um, 
I think it's because I believe I am a writer much more than I am anything else. I, definitely for the first album, I didn't even believe that I would ever make a decent singer. Um, although I, I, I had belief as a writer then. The second album, I, I, I started to believe in myself as a singer and I think it showed because the two albums sounded very different vocally. But I think at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I do. I don't believe that I am important as a pop star. I don't think that there are many people that are important as pop stars in the sense that they used to be. I don't believe that I will leave a, a great mark as a uh, as a an entity. You know, um, I think I'm more realistic than that. I I do believe now that I'm a lot better singer than I ever thought I would be. But at the end of the day, I, I want to leave something as a writer, and I think to have a passion or to have something that drives you on through life um, in a creative sense. Most most of us want to leave something, want to have something that will be remembered without, you know, having without people really having to search in their memory. Um, and I want to leave songs. I believe I can leave songs that, that will be, will mean something to other generations. In Praying for Time, George Michael deals with the theme of an uncaring world a subject far removed from anything he's written before. There comes a point where you have to write something which you have not written before and which your interest, um, your interest in any particular topic or, or subject will inspire you. And that's why I suppose eventually most lyricists do, do uh, um, approach wider topics than, than sex and love, you know. These are the days of the open hand they will not be the last. Look around now, these are the days of the beggars and the choosers. The open hand, to me, represents um, the vast numbers of people who, and, and specifically in this, this country, vast numbers of people who, act, who are actually uh, on the poverty line or below the poverty line, um, which is something that's going to go on. And I like the idea of beggars and the choosers because you take a phrase What's the phrase, you know, um, beggars can't be choosers, and you completely change it. In other words, the beggars and the choosers and nothing in between, which was really my point, because it does seem to be not that much in between these days. This is the year of the hungry man whose place is in the past, hand in hand with ignorance and legitimate excuses. That verse is really about the fact that the hungry men of today are completely, I mean, there is a full knowledge of them. People know what's going on, not well, it's in this country and abroad, and the legitimate excuse of yesterday was was that ignorance, and that's gone, obviously. So, in, in other words, the hungry man today is 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 a well-known fact. I guess somewhere along the way, he must have let us all out to play, turned his back, and all God's children crept out the back door. I've always um, liked the term somehow, God's children somehow as though um, we were uh, that innocent in a way and and um, the idea being that we let we ran out on God in a sense you know to, um, crept out the back door and because of that um, we're, we're left to make our own decisions we'll take our chances because God stopped keeping score is like saying there is no one here, there's no one here to, to you know pull back the reins, so we have to make our own decisions. These are the days of the open hand They will not be the last Look around now These are the days of the bears and the choosers This is the year of the hungry man Whose place is in the past George Michael's career has for many years been seen in terms of image rather than content. His early desire to be a star has run parallel with his ambitions as a songwriter. I have two very, very strong memories of my childhood. I remember being on a bus and I was um, 
I was uh, basically bunking off school and I was terribly depressed at school. I can't remember what about, but I remember I was just riding around on buses all day thinking that I'd get caught if I was out somewhere and someone would spot me and that the safest place to be was on a bus. And I remember thinking to myself, one day, no one will be able to touch you. You'll somehow get away from everyone else in some respect. And the other thought was when I was about 14 years old, I remember I was washing up in my father's restaurant and I was listening to something. Uh, it was on, on a tape machine in the restaurant itself. And it occurred to me that something, some melody shouldn't have gone that way. It should have gone another way. And it suddenly occurred to me that I would have, I would have written it that other way. That was the first moment that I ever remember thinking I could write that, but better. And somehow those two things, I somehow think I got those two things. Uh, they, they kind of, I've spent the last ten years of my life really confusing those two things. I've confused the fact that I thought I had that ability as a writer, that something I could do something special as a writer, with that need to be special in some way. And I don't feel that need to be a star anymore. I don't feel that need um, to prove anything on a, that I'm some kind of different kind of person, um, which leaves me, leaves me open to pursue the second thought, which is that I would actually li like to leave something special behind me which has nothing to really to do with me as a person being in any way different, just that my ability is as a songwriter. It's my songs that I, I, I think I can concentrate on now. These are the days of the empty hand Oh, you hold on to what you can This is the year of the building man You tell him this and take the stand And you find that what was over there is over here Like a beat on coke, but it's just...